Welcome, all you happy warriors, to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where, of course, you already know, I, your rabbi, devote myself solemnly to revealing how the world really works. And you are a happy warrior. That's why you're listening to this show right now. And as a happy warrior, you're somebody who is already a small part of a tiny proportion of human beings who take responsibility for their own happiness. That's what makes you a happy warrior. And you're a happy warrior because you're not frightened of a fight. You will stand up for what is right. You are not in any way intimidated. You are willing to deal with confrontation, and you are willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with other happy warriors and to push back against the cultural forces that would try and destroy everything that you hold dear. But today I want to give you yet another aspect of being a happy warrior. Just when you thought you had this down, right? Just when you were beginning to think, oh, this is easy, there's nothing much to being a happy warrior, and you've got it and it's okay. I have to add something today. So don't worry about running out of challenges. Don't worry about life becoming boring. No! Here is more. Well, perhaps the story starts all the way back in 1769. On an island that lies just south of Genoa, Italy, and just west of Rome, Italy, right there in the Mediterranean, as a matter of fact, if you drew a straight line from Nice on the French Riviera directly to Rome in Italy, that line would pass through the island of Corsica. And in the year 1769, on the island of Corsica, was born a little boy called Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, essentially a, a Corsican peasant family, and uh, Napoleon um, is a determined young man, and he uh, goes to France because Corsica had belonged to Italy, but then France got it, and so Napoleon went to France, and Nothing much happens, you know, until he's about 16 or 17. Uh, but that's when he starts getting interested in the military. So um, along comes, in 1787, along comes the French Revolution. Napoleon is now all of 18 years old, because the French Revolution was 1787, was born in 1769, so Napoleon Bonaparte is now 18 years old, and he joins the revolutionaries against the royalists. And um, he uh, begins to be uh, quite effective, and he's recognized. Uh, he's, he's seen as a leader. Um, he becomes more involved with the military, and by 10 years later, Ten years later, he is winning wars for France. You know, he gets sent to deal with a little war here, a little war there. And uh, don't forget, France was a powerful empire already at this point, but you know, not, nothing like what it was yet to become. And, uh, and so uh, from 18 to 28, he's, he's making a name for himself in the military. Um, in 1799, okay, he's now 30 years old, and 12 years have gone by since the French Revolution. It's not been a tranquil period. France has been torn apart, and uh, thanks to the guillotine and the mad excesses of Robespierre, 
who finally fell victim to his own enthusiasms, um, a, an entire segment of French society, socially, militarily, economically, have been wiped out. And these revolutionaries, who you can think of as very much like the people who rioted across the streets of America in the summer of 2020 and caused incredible damage, loss of life, that's you can think of the revolutionaries of the French Revolution something like that. That's the kind of that's kind of where they were in society. And uh, twelve years after the French Revolution, there's still no harmony. Uh, the turbulent storms still swirl around French society, and um, and they finally set up what they call a directory, uh, a five person. Um, a group of people to run France because it's it's becoming it's chaotic it's uh, it's it's anarchic and so they set up the directory and uh, Napoleon twelve years after the revolution he's thirty years old he overthrows the directory he overthrows the five people and he becomes the first consul essentially the leader of France a 30-year-old peasant from Corsica. By 1800, okay, a year later, he's destroyed Austria, France's enemy at that point, and France basically owns the continent of Europe. Uh, by the way, in by 1803, you know, he's he's running a huge army and he needs money. So Napoleon sells what was known as the Louisiana Territory to the United States. He's 34 years old, by the way. And he sells France's possessions in North America to the United States, and he gets the money he needs. A year later, he crowns himself emperor. <laughs> so, I mean, the, you know, in, in Hebrew, the word for this is chutzpah. It's incredible unbelievable impertinence it's it's outrageous audacity crowns himself emperor of what at that point was the french empire it's a big place um five years later um the F france owns literally all of europe from the english channel to the russian border and he's got all kinds of deals with the Russians anyway. So um, that's, uh, that's 1809. And you know what's coming, right? Because the Russian composer Tchaikovsky wrote a piece of music called the 1812 Overture. And this was uh, to celebrate Napoleon's conquering of Russia. Didn't quite work out that way. Uh, 1812. Napoleon is tired of just owning Europe from the English Channel up to the Russian border, and he marches on Russia. And the, uh, the, he, he marches there, by the way, with 600,000 foot soldiers. Think about, just think about how much space that occupies. Imagine laying out 600,000 armed men. Imagine them in a column. And just think how long that column is. And he goes to Russia, and along comes the Russian winter, and uh, it defeats him. The Russians couldn't defeat him, but the Russian winter did defeat him. And out of 600,000 men in his army, he struggles back to Paris with fewer than 10,000 men from 600 thousand down to ten thousand men um that was 1812 by 1815 he is uh exiled to a little island in the south atlantic a lonely little isolated island called saint helena and uh six years later napoleon is dead at the age of 52 what a story now, this is why I'm telling you this. 
there is a spectrum line you can think of it as as a scale uh, with two ends one end is labeled will and anyone who's at that end has an incredible iron irresistible willpower and at the other end is wisdom now where was napoleon on this scale it's very easy very easy to tell he had literally he had no wisdom but he had a very powerful will incredibly powerful will so napoleon was all over at the will end of the spectrum without any wisdom by the way only a hundred years later there's another guy who becomes a dictator in europe in this case germany and his name was hitler and he was exactly the same zero wisdom incredibly powerful will people found it hard to resist him his will prevailed uh, you know, and uh, both men shared a, a number of similarities i mean they were ascetic um women exerted very little power over them okay which is unusual for us normal guys and um and uh, everything was a focus of their willpower both napoleon and hitler i'm not saying they were the same in, in other ways but in uh, in the sense of neither possessing much wisdom both possessing fearsome willpower in that way they were same they, they were similar now where do you want to be on the will wisdom end i've told you what happens if you are on the will end but what happens if you're on the wisdom end? Well, you might become uh, somebody who's an academic or an intellectual. You'd be, uh, let's put it this way, uh, the people who are at the wisdom end of the scale have very little action going on. They're not doers, they're thinkers. Those who are at the will end of the spectrum are not much in the way of thinkers. They operate on instinct and sheer will. So you can see that obviously to be way over at the will end is really terrible. Uh, to be able to, f to have to function in the world with no wisdom at all, it's a, it's a disaster for you and for others. But to be over at the wisdom end is just as much of a disaster because the odds are that the person over at the wisdom end actually never achieves anything, doesn't do anything. The person at the will end achieves a great deal, often very damaging. And here's another thing. Since the person at the will end has zero wisdom, he doesn't know when to stop. He doesn't know when it's time to call a halt, obviously, because he has no wisdom. And so both Napoleon and Hitler pushed far enough to cause their own destructions. I've often mentioned that if Hitler uh, would have quit early on, he would have probably gone down as one of the great statesmen of world history. And the same is true for Napoleon. They both pushed too far. You know, if we were going to do more on, this, on the history, I'd go into which years each one should have stopped for the best result. But that's not for now. For now, what I want to explain is that you need will and you also need wisdom now i can convey to you the wisdom and in fact for many of you this podcast does exactly that if i interpret the kind letters that you write to me if i interpret them correctly uh, that is what you recognize you're gaining that's wonderful those of you who are studying the scrolling through scripture peer, uh, program with me, well, you're gaining wisdom there as well. It's, and again, you know, let me just stress, I'm not saying it's my wisdom, it's the wisdom of ancient Jewish wisdom, but it's real, it's how the world really works, and uh, you're able to get it. And by the way, um, you want to hear something nice? Uh, for a while, you can actually hear the first 
lesson of scrolling through scripture for free right now and you'll find in the description below you will find uh, how to do that right but uh, you you go to the script description below click on it you will be able to hear the intro the first lesson introducing scrolling through scripture uh, you will hear me uh, lecturing on the first verse of the bible in the beginning god created heaven and earth did you know that it has seven words and 28 letters and why should you care about that and why does it say heaven and earth why doesn't it just say in the beginning god created everything god created the universe what does heaven and earth mean and why are there two small two-letter words that don't seem to have any translation tucked into that sentence what's that all about and what impact do these facts have on how you live your life on the decisions you make and on how you develop your willpower and your wisdom so i think you'll enjoy it uh, i know i enjoyed preparing it it's the first half hour lesson in scrolling through scripture and um, uh, the my office has made it available so that you can actually just go ahead and listen to it and watch it <laughs> i shouldn't say just listen uh, you're listening to me now but scrolling through scripture you watch the reason is because i actually i actually have to show you certain things in the original hebrew i mean obviously i know that you don't know hebrew you don't read hebrew that's fine but uh, there are certain things that you are able to understand and recognize once i show you certain hebrew letters and you will thrill as i do to the amazing magic that leaps off the page of certain hebrew words and letters so that's why it's a video which you can watch and listen to uh, called um, lesson one in scrolling through scripture uh, you can either search for it at the website at rabbidaniellappin.com or just click on the right link in the description below and let me know how you like it please do uh, you know you know that on the website at rabbidaniellappin.com or you need a rabbi.com uh, you know there's a place where you can click about us and there on there on the drop down there's uh, contact us and that's how you send me an email and i love hearing from you so please do that and so i am uh, dedicated to making the wisdom available to you but how about the will see i can convey the wisdom to you but the will only you can develop and build how do you develop your will? Well, will is like any muscle. You know, if, uh, if I work out at, at a gym for a long time and I can bench press, you know, large weights, later on when I need to uh, lift up something in my house, the same muscle works for both. Similarly, if you build up your will, on shall we say exercising regularly or eating healthily and building your will means uh, denying yourself things that are bad for you but that you feel like or making yourself do things you don't feel like doing but that are good for you right and again napoleon is a great example of this uh, the the point i i want to make very clear to you is that by following your 5f program by following the program that helps you focus on your family on your finance on your friendships on your faith and on your fitness you will be developing your will your willpower will grow it's so beautiful you know by deciding to turn down a purchase i mean you really have been wanting to buy this thing and then you say to yourself wait a second do i really need this thing right now or would i do better by having this in my investment account and you don't spend it but you do invest it 
not only are you doing your finances a favor, you're increasing your willpower. Um, if, you, uh, uh, if you resist the blandishments and enticements of a seductive person and remain faithful to your spouse and to your convictions and commitments, not only are you doing something that's good for your family, you're building up your willpower. When you remain in contact with friends and you find ways to help friends, you're building your willpower. When you make yourself act in areas of faith in certain ways, and I cover that in more detail, I don't want to go into it now, uh, you are assisting in the growth of your willpower and fitness, obviously, right? You eat the right things, not the things you feel like. You exercise the way you must do, not the way you feel like doing. You're building your willpower. So that way, uh, working on both your wisdom and your willpower, you are able to become a more powerful human being, a more effective human being, and one who is able to live a happy and fulfilling life. Now, I, uh, uh, I, 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 saying I told you so, you know, is unseemly with friends and family, isn't it? I mean, you don't want to say to your friends, I told you, I told you that would happen. And, uh, you know, you're telling your family, or oh, I, I told you, no, you know, you don't want to do that. It's a little unseemly. But on this show, this show is more than friends and family. This show is an institution already. And if reminding you occasionally that I told you so, if that helps you to tell others about the show, well, let's go for it. What about when I'm wrong, when I predict wrongly, and I, it, I, I'm not able to say I told you so? Well, then I tell you when I'm wrong. Um, back in uh, 1990, 1990 or 91, uh, I predicted that there would be a change in currency to stop people um, holding reserves of cash and building a cash economy, uh, avoiding taxation in that fashion. And I said there would be an issue of, of new types of currency, and eventually the old currency would be uh, phased out entirely. Uh, I was wrong that that prediction did not happen. And uh, and I've, I've explained at other times why I thought it would happen and why, in fact, it didn't. But I was plain and simply wrong. Uh, but when I'm right, I like telling you that also. You may remember that in May, March to May 2016, I already told you that Donald Trump would win in November 2016. I told you that. I told you so. Well, in 2015, they said, when I say they, I'll tell you who they are, Everyone, basically, everyone in the industry said that there are going to be autonomous self-driving cars mostly on the road by 2020. I told you at the time, in 2015, I told you of the predictions. I told you that uh, Toyota said that they will have self-driving cars on the roads by 2020. Uh, Nissan did the same thing. Uh, Ford did the same thing. Motoring journals and motoring journalists were telling you, yes, self-driving cars, that's the way of the future. That's what's going to happen. Look, I told you in 2015, it's not going to happen. If you are a long-time listener and you were already listening in 2015, then you may even remember some of the reasons I gave back then as to why autonomous cars will not be here by 2020 and probably not by 2030 either. That's not to say the technology won't exist to do it part of the way, uh, but there were a lot of other obstacles. Uh, one of the obstacles is that uh, men like driving their cars. I've told you before that if you look on the road and you look at couples in a car, in about 80-something percent of the cases, the man is behind the wheel. 
how come after 60 years of gender equality and 60 years of aggressive, fierce feminism, fierce, fanatical feminism, if you don't mind a three-part alliterative, uh, after 60 years of fierce and fanatical feminism, you'd have thought that by now, in at least 50% of the cases of drivers, the woman would say to the man, honey, toss me the keys, I'll drive. No. Men prefer being behind the wheel, particularly if they have a woman in the car. Not every man, right? I, I know guys who prefer their wives to drive, but a large percentage. That's one of the reasons that many of us men will not go for autonomous cars. Uh, there was another reason as well I told you at the time, and that is that um, a self-driving car has to be programmed, and you have to decide, are you going to program it to protect the driver at all costs, even at the cost of others' lives, or are you going to program the car to do the least amount of damage within society? And so the computer is going to figure out, well, that's a young person um, on the sidewalk, and uh, she has a lot of her life to still live. You're an older person. And so uh, I'm not going to say the computer is going to say, you know what, slam into the semi ahead and get decapitated. That's fine. I'm not going to have you swerve onto the sidewalk and kill the younger person. Now, in real life driving, people make split second decisions one way or the other without even thinking about them. And nobody ever comes to the survivor of an accident and says, you know, why did you decide to do that? Because everyone understands it happens in an instant. People sometimes make one a decision that saves their lives. Sometimes they make a decision that costs their lives. When you're driving, it's your decision. But to cold heartedly and callously program a computer to do that well, I'll ask you, are you ready to do that? I'm not. That's just one of the many reasons I told you back then that self-driving cars are not happening right now. Uh, we're probably decades away, to tell you the truth. And, um, and I would say that the entire humongous program of self-driving cars, many different companies, including Google, the entire thing, was really nothing but a jobs program for people who had PhDs in robotics. I mean, that's what it's turned out to be. Thousands of highly qualified young, and I'll tell you it's mostly men, like 95% men, um, got very nice paying jobs by working in, in autonomous vehicles. And the autonomous vehicles companies raised stupendous amounts of capital because they kept on issuing press releases saying, we're only a few weeks away. Uh, have a look at this picture or this video of a test run. This car is going down a city street entirely without a driver. And people rushed to invest money. But they haven't seen anything for that. Now, I want you to cast your memories back. And you've got to be... Um, you got to be older than a certain age because I actually ran this by a few friends earlier this week, younger friends, and they actually didn't know what I was talking about. But I'm talking about a TV show called The Flintstones. Do you remember The Flintstones? Um, the, uh, it was Fred and Wilma Flintstone and Barney and Betty Rubble, and it was a brilliant show, I thought. Um, it was created by two amazing entertainment and animation professionals, William Hanna and Joseph Barbera. And they started working together in 1957. And the Flintstones was one of their first really big hits. And the Flintstones ran from about 1960 to, I think, about 66. And you'll still find it rerunning on, on late night television sometimes. Um, the Flintstones, right? It's this idea, it, these prehistoric folks living in the olden days, and and the the whole joke was that they would come up with all the things the modern world has. They would create in primitive form. They'd use a dinosaur as an excavator, and uh, and Barney or was it Fred had a car, 
and admittedly he had to paddle it with his feet pushing on the ground and oh they never wore shoes i remember anyway that was the flintstones and the hannah barbera um, company the animation company realized what a great success they had there and these were two very bright guys uh, bill hannah and joe barbera and uh, they thought, well, why don't we come up with another show, except we'll go to the other end of the extreme. Instead of going back to prehistoric times, we're going to look forward and cast a show that will be set in the year 2062. Now, the reason they, they chose 2062 is because the Jetsons was the show and it began in 1962. So it was supposed to be a glimpse ahead to what life would be like a hundred years hence, the year 2062. And um, and so I'm assuming you haven't uh, seen the Jetsons, but you can, by the way, on the Internet. You can see episodes of both the Flintstones and the Jetsons, but uh, I'm chiefly interested in the Jetsons uh, in this show today. And um, the Jetsons ran from about 1962 to uh, about 66 maybe 65 66 and then again of course moved from prime time to saturday mornings and and it just ran forever um the jetson family is george jetson he is uh, about 40 years old we're, we're told in one of the episodes and he lives with his family in the sky pad <laughs> the sky pad apartments um his wife jane is 33 She's a homemaker um, and, and a loving wife and mother. Uh, their teenage daughter is Judy, who goes to, was it Orbit, Orbit High School? I think Orbit High School. And Elroy, their son, is a little uh, whiz kid. He's eight years old. And he goes to Little Dipper School. And uh, they've got a robot maid that does the vacuuming. Her name is Rosie. And um, and this the show must have run for at least twenty years, maybe longer. It was really very successful. And um, one of the, the 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 special moments, of course, is that George Jetson has a flying car. And when he lands, he goes up to his roof from his house, gets in his flying car, flies to work. When he gets to work, he lands on the roof of his office, and then packs up his flying car into his briefcase and he goes to work now here is the really funny thing about the jetsons you see there's two parts to the brilliance of the artistic creator creativity of uh, hannah and barbara and it's the way these two elements of the show play off against each other that makes the show work the first part, as I see it, is what was seen as absurdly futuristic things. What they imagined the world would look like in 2062, um, you know, everybody was, was, was going to have flying cars that land on the roof and then fold away. Everyone was going to have video phones. Can you believe it? That you can actually see the person you're talking to. Wow. Yes, the Jetsons showed that first. Um, then you'll see uh, Jane will sort of tap her device to command a robot to vacuum the floors. Anyone have a Roomba? A Roomba is a little gadget that will vacuum every single square inch of a room's floor. Right? You didn't have to wait till 2062. It's right there, and you can command it right off your, your mobile phone, which also lets you video talk to anybody. You know what else they had on uh, the Jetsons? Flat-screen TVs. Now, remember, in the real world back then, televisions all operated on cathode ray tubes and had, um, you know, the, these were very large, heavy boxes. But on the Jetsons, flat-screen televisions. There was no such thing back in 1962. They also have smartwatches. Right? Do you have a phone that links to your Apple phone or a phone that links to your Samsung or your Android phone? Yeah, many of you do. Um, do you know what else? When George Jetson went to the doctor in one episode, the doctor gave him a little, t a little camera that was no bigger than a tablet. 
and this was going to give him an internal checkout. Well, they got that now. And so it's fascinating to me how many of the far out futuristic absurdities that the creators of the Jetsons came up with that are now, we didn't have to wait till 2062, that are now already a reality. Incredible. Now, here's part two of the the, the second element of the show. The first part is this incredibly imaginative um, tech creativity. And the second part is that contrasted with this is this charmingly traditional marriage and family. George works and supports the family. Jane is a stay-at-home mom. (laughs) What other kind of mom is there, actually? And she married young, by the way. Jane married young because she had her oldest child, Judy, when she was 18, because we know that Jane, uh, Jane is 33, and we know Judy is 15. So Judy uh, was born when Jane, her mom, was 18 years old. So, right, she, she was young. Isn't, you know, I mean, it was amazing. She was 18, George was 25, and they got married and started a family. And Jane loves her family. She lives for them. She enjoys taking care of them. Uh, Wow. So here's the funny thing. So many of the wildest predictions of the Jetsons are true by 2021. Although the creators didn't dream that any of these things would really happen. And the one, in, in fact, they were trying to come up with the most outlandish futuristic things possible. But the one thing that the creators never dreamed would not be the case was the traditional nuclear family. In 1962, that was how most Americans lived in a family like that. Moms were moms. They were not career gals. Moms were moms. And dads were dads. And men were men and women were women. And I wish that Hannah and Barbera, Bill Hannah and Joe Barbera were still alive. I'd love to have gone and spoken to them and asked them a little bit about, you know, what were they thinking? And now, aren't they shocked that the family that is so much a part of the Jetsons doesn't, is today under terrible attack, and it's a rarity? Let me ask you, and whatever country you're in, and I just got a note from somebody listening in Romania, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, people listening in in Russia and uh, so many, many different countries around the world. So I don't know what it would be like in the countries you're in. But I can tell you this, that in the United States of America, if a 12th grade girl in high school announced to her teacher and her class, I want to be a wife and mom just like Jane Jetson, she'd be torn apart by the hyenas of wokedom. Can you imagine? To, to, to this day, I mean, many women are embarrassed to put down on a form occupation housewife or homemaker. They're embarrassed, and I understand it entirely. I do get it because you get looked at pityingly. Uh, you get um, rude comments, you know, as if, oh, you know, you, you obviously weren't ambitious enough to do anything more. It's a shocking thing. So, All I can say is if you are a young woman and every molecule in your body is shrieking at you to get married and have a family, just do it. Don't worry about what society is telling you. Don't worry about what the culture is telling you. Don't worry about what wokedom is telling you. You should listen to the feminine in you. Now, I told you all of that because I also wanted to tell you a bit more of George Jetson's flying car. You see, every vision of flying these days involves electric aircraft. Air taxis hopping from one skyscraper to the next um, as airliners cruise silently over the oceans. After all, in this enlightened time, 
where we are all woke and we are all solidly bought in to the danger of climate change and the horrors of using fossil fuels, what kind of future traveler would depend on fossil fuels? <laughs> you know what the answer is? Actually, anybody who wants to go anywhere, that's who. That's what I'm telling you. That's right. And I'm, I'm mentioning this because I am sure that you have heard the hype about electric airplanes. You've heard it. And as part of growing wisdom, we all have to remember that just because a lot of people say something does not make it true. What's the difference between a flying car and a regular airplane? I'm going to think about that for a second. What's the difference between a flying car and a regular airplane? The answer, the runway. A flying car just takes off vertically off the roof of your building and then flies and then drops down vertically onto the roof of your destination. <coughs> but a regular aircraft, well, it has to build up speed from the start of its journey. It has to build up speed to the point where enough high-speed air is moving over the wing in order to create more lift than the airplane weighs. And that is what makes it ascend. That's what makes it get airborne. And that only happens when it's moving at a certain speed. I think for um, most regular airplanes like Boeing 737s today, that's about 160 miles an hour, something like that. And so before it can get off the ground, it's got to be traveling at that. So it starts from zero at the beginning of the runway, and the you can hear the engines, right? They, they, they're given full power, and then it starts moving faster and faster and faster. It's doing what we call accelerating down the runway. Now, from the during that time it's accelerating along the runway, the airplane is using up runway from zero to 160 miles an hour. That can take maybe, you know, something like a mile. To, to get to that speed and lift off the ground. And that's why airports are big, because you've got to accommodate runways of, you know, 5,000 feet and, and much more. That's why the airports are so big. And they that's also why airports need to be far out of town, because otherwise the real estate is very expensive and you get people complaining about noise and there are other problems. And so... What this does, it makes travel by air paradoxically very time costly because the trip to and from the airport can take as long as some flights do. See? So the solution to the problem, the flying car of the Jetsons or what we now call EV tolls. E, and it's spelled E-V-T-O-L, means electric, vertical, takeoff, landing, airplane. E-V-T-O-L, E-V-T-O-L, E-V-T-O-L. And uh, the idea is that there's going to be a big fleet of air taxis, like Ubers, that operate on electric, they like big drones, you see. And it just lifts off right up into the air vertically, needing no runway at all. It can lift off a roof. Imagine a skyscraper in, say, um, New York City. Say the big MetLife building on, in the middle of Park Avenue and 45th Street in Manhattan. It takes easily an hour, sometimes more, to drive the 15 miles to Kennedy Airport. It's ghastly, by the way. I mean, if you want to save yourself stress and you're in midtown Manhattan and you've got to get to Kennedy... Just leave yourself loads and loads and loads of time because there can be road construction, there can be a traffic jam, there can be an accident, and 15 hours, which you, I mean 15 miles, which you'd think should be done in 15 minutes, um, but it never takes less than an hour, and that can now stretch to two hours. I've, I've been in a car for two hours from Midtown Manhattan to the airport. So now um, imagine that you're taking a one-hour flight from 
uh, New York to Charlotte, North Carolina. So uh, it now takes you at least an hour to get to the airport, an hour in the air to Charlotte, never mind checking in and all that, and then a half an hour in the uh, car from Charlotte Airport to your hotel in the city of Charlotte. So two and a half hours for a one-hour flight. Now, imagine you, you could go up to the roof of your building, say the MetLife building, which used to be the Pan Am building back in the day, and uh, that was when that airline ruled the world. And you would just go up to the top of MetLife building, and you'd grab a flying car to Kennedy Airport, 10 minutes max, say another 10 minutes at the Charlotte end, and the one-hour flight on top, so this one-hour flight takes an hour and 20 minutes instead of a minimum of two and a half hours the other way. Wouldn't it be great if you could fly from the roof of the MetLife building to Kennedy Airport? Oh, wait, you used to be able to do just that. It was called a helicopter. There was an airline called New York Airways. And they flew big Sikorsky helicopters for about 10 years. And they flew a service from the top of the Pan Am building to Kennedy Airport. And that's what people do. You went to the Pan Am, you know, you had a flyer, you were in Midtown Manhattan, take the subway over to Park uh, uh, Avenue and 45th Street, which happens to be Grand Central Terminal, take the elevator up to uh, the Pan Am office, check in, buy your ticket, do whatever you have to do, continue the elevator up to the roof, step into your helicopter. Ten minutes later, you are uh, boarding your airplane at Kennedy Airport. That was the day. And that continued until May 1977. On the 16th of May in the year 1977, an accident happened. Um, it was an accident caused by metal fatigue. One of the wheel supports on the giant Sikorsky helicopter gave way, and the helicopter, which had just dropped off or was just unloading its passengers from Kennedy Airport, and the they never stopped the rotors. The rotors kept on turning. People um, from Kennedy got off, and then they were just getting ready to load on other people for the trip to the airport when the side support collapsed. The helicopter tipped to its side, the spinning rotors snapped off and went flying, and uh, five people were killed, and that was the end of flying from the roof of buildings. Never happened again. And uh, from that day to this, nobody has flown from the route. You can take a helicopter from the East River sea, uh, Seaport, I think it's called. You can do that, and that's very nice, but, uh, but not from the top of buildings any longer. But you see, the problem is that helicopters are noisy, and they are polluting, right? Because they spit out so much carbon. And they're scary. And they are dangerous. And they're very elitist. You know, only rich people can ride helicopters in the public perception. And so helicopters as the solution for getting from the middle of town to the airport, not so easy. Even though they do solve the runway problem. Technically, you should be able to land at Charlotte Airport, step into a helicopter, and be dropped right in the middle of Charlotte. Should be able to. Doesn't need a, a runway. But um, everyone is hoping that it's going to be electrical, vertical takeoff and landing planes. That's what it's going to be like. A big drone, more than one motor, it's quiet, it's non-polluting, etc., etc., etc. It won't help to make the sea level rise, uh, which, you know, as you know, is happening so quickly that um, as a public service, I just want to mention I would be willing to buy any oceanfront property in Florida or on Long Island, and I will give you as much as 50 cents on the dollar for your property. And you should grab my offer because, as you know, the water level is rising so quickly that pretty soon your property won't be worth anything at all. So accept my generous offer of 50 cents on the dollar, and I will be happy as a public service 
to take your ocean front property off your hands and uh, the only thing that can slow it down would be electrical airplanes and so that would work great um, it's wonderful that they've got these electrical uh, vertical takeoff and landing air taxis already isn't it or do they what do you think think about it you've probably seen announcements about them you probably might have even have seen really pretty beautiful uh, videos on the internet of a VTOL, uh, EVTOL, electrical vertical takeoff landing, uh, flying vehicles. Um, you know, there they are. I mean, they're out there. We're very close to being able to use these, and, and it'll solve so many problems. Right? Well, is that right? Um, there are quite a few companies working on this. I'll give you a partial list just so that if you hear these names, you'll know what they are. Joby Aviation in Northern California, J-O-B-Y. Uh, Volocopter in Germany. Archer Aviation, that's in Palo Alto, Northern California. Uh, Lilium, Lilium is making these planes in Munich, Germany. Uh, Airbus, as if they don't have their hands full building the planes they're building, they're also going into this electrical, vertical takeoff and landing uh, vehicle and they're in toulouse in france of course then there's a company called ehang in gongshao in china and they're working on it um in the united kingdom there's a company called vertical aerospace they're in bristol um there is a company called urban aeronautics in tel aviv israel uh, there's a company called sky drive in japan most of these companies have been valued by the market at more than $2 billion. They've also all raised huge amounts of capital. For instance, Joby Aviation uh, has raised over $750 million. That's nearly a billion dollars in capital. So they must have a flying vehicle already to show for all of that, right? After all, they have 400 highly qualified engineers working for them gotta be and like i said you really can see all kinds of videos of them on the internet however if you look carefully you'll discover something that i've discovered as well and that is you cannot find a single video that shows one of these electrical vertical takeoff landing vehicles carrying a payload of say a minimum of two people and taking off and flying a at least a 15 minute flight in between and then landing you cannot find that it's not on the internet nothing niente nichts nada shum davar miyushma nikevo takova nothing there's nothing there don't you think that with all of these companies raising huge sums of money, don't you think that if they could pull off this minimum level of what is called urban air mobility, UAM, urban air mobility, if they could pull off this minimum, a takeoff, a landing, two people on board, and a 15-minute flight, don't you think they would announce that? But they are all carefully couching their announcements in very ambiguous terms. And no air journalists have claimed to have been shown this happening. Well, why would that be? Isn't everybody saying that we're just about ready for these vehicles? Well, there's a good reason they're not showing it. I've, I mean, I've not seen it. There's a good reason. You see, batteries, well, <sighs> batteries pack less than 10% of the energy that gasoline packs for the same weight. It's about 7% at the very best. Remember that every year a lithium-ion battery loses at least 3% of its holding capacity. You've noticed that on your phone. Right? If you've kept a phone for a few years, you'll discover that it starts not, it, it doesn't last as long as it did when it was new. And 
owners of Teslas will tell you that the mileage you you get in between charges in year two and year three is not the same as you got in year one. The battery is deteriorating. And eventually, eventually, uh, you're going to say to yourself, you know what, it's just, this is no good. I need to get a new battery. Or in the case of a phone, you may say you have to get a new phone. It's just a fact of uh, lithium-ion batteries. They do that. And uh, at its very best, right, a battery provides 7% of the energy that a, an amount of gasoline of the same weight would provide. So let me give you an example. A Tesla battery weighs 1,200 pounds. <laughs> That's over half a ton, by the way. A Tesla battery weighs over 1,200 pounds. And it provides only 7% of the energy that you'd get from 200 gallons of gasoline. Why do I say 200? Because gasoline weighs about 6 pounds a gallon. So six, uh, 200 gallons weighs about 1,200 pounds, which is the weight of a Tesla battery. So 200 gallons of gasoline would give you 14 times more power, more power than the Tesla battery at the same weight. Now, a plane has to do, I, I hope I'm not boring you with this. And, you know, Susan Lappin always worries that uh, women will be turned off when I start discussing some of these technical things. But there's a point to all of this, number one. Number two, uh, I think she's wrong. Because I've actually heard by mail from women who've gone to my website, rabbidaniellappin.com, and sent me an email saying, you know, we enjoy the, the technical stuff. Now, if some of you don't, uh, I wish, you know, let's hope you haven't turned off already and that you hear my beseeching and imploring you to please write and tell me. Tell me not to do this. But... Um, what I'm talking about is is how the world really works, and you have to know this. And you know, I'm I'm sure you're not investing in an EV toll airplane manufacturer. I'm sure you're much too smart for that. But uh, but even just when people tell you, oh, next year we're going to be seeing uh, ways to to fly. No, we're not. And I'm just explaining to you why that is. Um, a lot of people saying something doesn't make it true, okay? So, um, <clears throat> so realize then that obviously weight is a huge issue when you're flying. Weight's not much of an issue on an electric car, right? Because you're just rolling down the road and you have nice bearings in the wheels and it rolls. So if, so if you're lugging along 1,200 pounds of battery, you know, okay, fine. Uh, but on an airplane... Weight is hugely important. And so if a 1,200-pound battery gives you, um, what does a Tesla give you these days? A little more than 300 miles of range. How many pounds of gasoline? You don't need 200 gallons of gasoline to give you that range. 200 gallons of gasoline would give you um, uh, 15 times to uh, like 3,000 miles of range, really. So it, it's so much lighter to power a gasoline engine or a jet engine on an airplane than it is a battery-driven. That's a really important factor. But it, that's not the only thing. I, I'm going to tell you a little more that I find very interesting, and I hope you will as well. And that is that taking off and landing are tremendous consumers of energy. Now, I'm not going to walk you through the physics calculations of why that is, but it's, you know, gaining altitude is like climbing a ladder. Walking down a hallway, you can do without putting up much energy, right? But if you're climbing a ladder, think of a stepmaster or a, a, a treadmill at an angle, gaining altitude takes a lot of energy and you will sweat much more climbing a ladder, a long ladder, than you will walking a long hallway. And it's the same with airplanes. Once it's up and flying straight and level, it uses much less fuel and energy than it takes to get from the, the ground up to flying altitude. So a plane, ha having to do so much more than just run along a road, 
taking off and landing are the big challenges because of how much electricity they use. Plus, aviation rules require very comfortable safety reserves. And here's something else. This you may not know, but if you've ever felt your phone while you're charging it, you will have noticed this. A lithium-ion battery gets very heated up while it's charging. And not surprisingly, not only does it get heated up when you're pushing electricity into the battery, but when you're pulling electricity out of the battery, it gets very hot. Now, your phone never draws enough current uh, in order to make the battery hot. If you are fast charging your phone, you will feel the, the case getting warm. But uh, with an airplane, the vast quantities of power that have to be drawn off the battery during landing and takeoff or takeoff and landing that is going to make the battery very hot and so it's going to need to be cooled because and very serious cooling by the way because uh, a heat destroys a battery i don't know if you know this uh, even a tesla car needs substantial cooling equipment what's being cooled the battery because when you put your foot down and you make a Tesla accelerate, very large quantities of amperage, of power, electrical power, is being drawn off the battery. The battery heats up, and heating up destroys a battery eventually. So they've got to keep it cool. That means this airplane has to have serious cooling equipment, particularly for the takeoff and landing. And... Um, and so this question of how quickly the stored energy can be used is very much a factor in aircraft design because um, ramping up to take off in a jet or pushing down against gravity in a, hel in a helicopter takes, takes much, much, much more power than turning the wheels of a car. So you see then that an EV tall, an, an electrical vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, uh, their batteries have to be able to discharge about 10 times faster than the batteries in a Tesla. And as I said, when batteries discharge that quickly, they get very hot. Uh, you'll find this with your laptop, by the way. If you pay attention, your laptop has fans to cool the central processing unit and some of the other wiring and your laptop fans will spin up to full speed and you'll be able to hear them blowing air through your motherboard um, whenever you try to stream a live TV show while playing a video game and downloading a large file. In other words, when you're drawing a lot of power off the battery, it heats up and uh, a vehicle battery pack needs to be cooled down even faster whenever it has to produce a lot of power suddenly. So road vehicles like Teslas, well, their batteries don't heat up nearly as much while driving. Even so, they do. Um, so they're cooled by relatively simple mechanisms. But an EVTOL, an electrical vertical takeoff landing taxi, would generate an enormous amount of heat on takeoff, and that would take quite a while to cool down. And so if it's a short 15-minute trip to, to the airport or wherever, it may well not even cool down before heating up again on the landing cycle. This is just an example of why I think I'm going to be able to say, I told you so, uh, when I tell you there won't be any air taxi service running on electrical vehicles in 2021. Not going to happen. And... Um, Again, I, I think 2030 might be an, uh, at the earliest, and even that would be very early. So it's not happening tomorrow. And, um, and by the way, a lot of these companies I listed to you are burning through their capital so quickly, there's no way they're going to last until 2030. It's not going to happen. So please be careful about believing all the hype. Just because a lot of people say something is so, it doesn't make it true. And careless reading of the promotional literature will tell you that flying cars are a few months away. It's not true. And next year I'll say, I told you so. 
and in 2022 and 2023 and 2024, I'm still going to say, I told you so, because that's what I'm telling you. Uh, my best guess, nothing less than 10 years, maybe double that, 20 years. Uh, and as I say, many of these companies won't even be around anymore. See, lithium-ion batteries have probably reached the peak of their performance. We're now up against real-life chemical limitations here. It's not just a technical problem that some clever engineer will solve. It's that you can calculate how much energy can be stored up in a lithium-ion battery, and we're just about there. We're getting a slight improvement, about a 1.5% improvement in batteries year by year, which is not nothing, but neither is it going to be enough to put EV tall aircraft in the air anytime soon. So um, for all the hype that electric aviation gets, the concepts that are put out by these aerospace companies and startups are literally somewhere in between impossible and not going to happen. Flying simply takes extraordinary amounts of energy. And doing so under electric power is going to need at least one colossal leap forward in battery technology. And that's not happening in the next, you know, six months or even six years. So um, don't pay attention to the hype too much, okay? And that applies to uh, so much, so much that you're hearing now, so much you hear in the news, so much you hear or watch on television. Ask yourself all along, does this fit in with how the world really works? And if it doesn't, don't be fooled. You don't have to believe something just because a lot of people say it so. So, my friends, please work on your wisdom and your will. You need them both. It's not enough to be smart. The, the effectiveness comes in the execution. And whether it's a business idea or taking care of yourself or looking after your family or building a family, it's the execution that makes the difference. Now, knowing what to do is part of it. That's the wisdom. But the will is very important. So stick with me, your rabbi, because I am solemnly dedicated to making sure that both your will, your willpower, and your wisdom grow exponentially, because that is the road to happiness and fulfillment. Please take a look. I know you're going to enjoy watching the first video lesson of scrolling through scripture. Check the description below for the link and um, let me know what you think of it, will you? I'd love to hear from you. I know you're going to like it. I'm positive you're going to like it. But uh, go ahead and see if I'm right. And then I will say, I told you so. Have a wonderful week growing your relationships with your family, with your faith, with your finances, with your friendships, and with your physical fitness. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.